Hi everyone, there's a, a book about to come out from the BBC's Mark Urban called The Skripal Files. Now, last year in 2017, Mark Urban met with Sergei Skripal uh, on several occasions because he was apparently writing a book on Skripal. And this information actually didn't come out until four months after um, Sergei Skripal was poisoned that Mark Urban had met with him. And a lot of people have theorized, have theorized maybe that had something to do with Skripal being poisoned. Um, the fact that he was talking to the press or talking to the BBC. So there's a, an article come out about that book, about some of the things in that book. And it's written by the imitable Luke Harding who, if you're not aware who Luke, Luke Harding is, Luke Harding is somebody who has ties to the British Secret Services, shall we say. Um, he's very pro-GCHQ, pro-spying, pro-Russiagate. Uh, he believes that uh, Donald Trump is, a, is an agent of, of the Kremlin and is in Putin's pocket. And he wrote a book called Collusion, which, as Alan Matai pointed out, with an interview with Luke Harding, in which Luke Harding called Alan Matte a collusion rejectionist and, and hung up the interview on him, Alan Matte pointed out that there, there was no actual evidence in Luke Harding's book on collusion of any collusion whatsoever. So it's interesting that he's written this article in The Guardian about this book that Mark Urban is about to publish. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read this article quickly, it's not long, and then I'll break it down at the end and just show you exactly what's in it. Because it's interesting to see how Luke Harding spins this. Okay, so the article says, Sergei Skripal initially did not believe Russia tried to kill him. What? He didn't think it was Russia? Former spy only gradually came to realise he had been a Kremlin target, says author. Oh, right, he only... Ra really? Hmm. Okay, he came to realise it, did he? Article says this, the poison's former spy, Sergei Skripal, was initially reluctant to believe the Russian government had tried to kill him, according to a new book, and despite selling secrets to MI6, was, quote, an unashamed Russian nationalist. Skripal struggled to come to terms with his situation following the Novichok attack on him and his daughter, Yulia, the author, and BBC journalist Mark Urban writes. The pair were targeted in March and nearly died. When Skripal woke five weeks later from a coma, he faced some difficult psychological adjustments, not least the fact that he was the, at first reluctant to recognise that he had been a target of a Kremlin murder plot. As an, as an information war raged between London and Moscow, Skripal recuperated and sometimes sat, sat in a garden near the main part of Salisbury Hospital. Against all predictions, doctors managed to save his and his daughter's life using novel therapies soap and water was it urban's book the skripal files is published this week i will definitely illegally download that in it urban recalls a series of meetings with skripal in summer 2017 when the russian spy was living quietly and apparently safely in an mi6 bought house in salisbury a safe house in salisbury apparently is yeah right okay according to urban Skripal said he was reluctant to be quoted directly, explaining, you see, we are afraid of Putin. He did not believe he was personally in danger, but wanted to avoid making public statements so Yulia Skripal and his son, Sasha, could visit him freely in Moscow. Urban discovered that Ur Skripal spent much of the d his day watching Russia's Channel 1, a pro-Kremlin state broadcaster. He adopted, quote, the Kremlin line in many matters, the journalist writes, even when sitting in his MI6 Purchase house especially over Moscow's fraught relations with R Ukraine. Skripal, a former paratrooper, supported Putin's 2014 annexation of Crimea and referred disparagingly to Ukrainians as, quote, simply sheep who ne needed a good shepherd. Skripal also refused to believe Russian troops had entered the eastern Ukraine covertly, saying that if they had, they would have quickly reached the capital, Kiev. The book does not answer the key question as to why Skripal's former organisation, the GRU, tried to kill him shortly before Russia's presidential vote. Got any evidence of that at all, Harding? No? OK, shut the hell up then and try not making those assertions, shall you, or shall we? Be a good journalist, shall we, Harding? Making assertions that aren't true. You could put their Theresa May alleges, that would be OK, but just stating it, as fact. 
Arse gravy of a journalist you are. His two would-be assassins, Colonel Anthony Chapiga and Alexander Petrov, a pseudonym, are career intelligence officers the government believes. Okay, he's, uh, he said the government believes. That's okay there. Urban corroborates reports that Skripal briefed Western intelligence agencies over his move to the UK in 2010. Following a spy swap, he travelled to the US in 2011, the Czech Republic in 2012 and Estonia. Last summer, he spent a week in Switzerland briefing its, its intelligence service, Urban writes. Still, these visits fail to explain why Moscow would try to kill him with Novichok, a Soviet nerve agent. Nobody's been able to explain that. It's unexplainable, is what it is. There are fresh details of Skripal's career as an undercover British asset in summer 96. An unnamed MI6 intelligence officer recruited him, <coughs> Pablo Miller. At the time, Skripal was stationed at Russia's foreign mission in Madrid. He had previously served in Malta and was a member of the GRU's Spanish residency. And the article concludes with this. In exchange for $3,000, Skripal handed over details of the GRU's organisation and command structure. This arrangement continued after he was recalled to Moscow. There were no face-to-face -face meetings with British spies, but Skripal wrote sensitive information in a book in invisible ink. His wife, Lyudmila, travelled to Spain and delivered the book to Skripal's MI6 case officer. <coughs> Christopher Still. The officer gave... Skripal a gift, a modern English cottage which later sat on the shelf of his Salisbury home. Skripal was betrayed by a mole inside Spanish intelligence, urban rights, and arrested in 2004. Skripal's current whereabouts are unknown. Yulia Skripal, whose whereabouts, whereabouts are also unknown, has indicated that she instead intends to return to Russia at some stage, but so far appears not to have done so. And that's what Luke Harding writes there. Now, as somebody put it, pointed out on Twitter, and I noticed this as well, but I've got to give this person, you know, the, the attention they deserve. Politique. Once you strip the propaganda out of that article and the way L Luke Harding has framed it, you start to look at what the facts are that are coming out of Mark Urban's book. And as you can see, he's pro-Kremlin. He was pro the reunification of Crimea with Russia. He was anti-Ukraine, in a way, saying that they are just sheep who needed a good shepherd. He has a pro-Russian position with regards to Ukraine, denies Russian troops ever invaded eastern Ukraine. And as they point out there, do you see now why they are keeping him away from the UK press? It's a really, it's interesting, once you actually delve into the facts... And you get behind what Luke Harding is asserting. Once you look at the facts and you, uh, you see the facts, it's, it's all spin. It's all spin with regards to what the UK government are accusing the Kremlin of doing. It's just spin. Because when you look at the facts, even Sergei Skripal thought, no, why would, why would Russia do that to me? I'm not doing anything against Russia. Why would, why would Russia do that? I know other people that might. He's probably thinking in the back of his head. It really is interesting. This is just propaganda that we're being fed by the mainstream media with, uh, with regards to the Skripal poisonings. And as I've pointed out many times before, it's, all, it's MI6. They're the key to this. I'm not saying MI6 did it at all, but they're the key to this. They're the people who... Um, the government put D-notices on. Those are the names that they put D-notices on. And Orbis Business Intelligence. And one of those names, obviously, was the person who wrote the dodgy dossier about Donald Trump peeing on a bed, or the two prostitutes peeing on a bed that Obama had slept in while Donald Trump was there. It's preposterous. It really is. And when even when you look at Luke, work by Luke Harding... If you actually just strip away what his narrative is and you look at the facts, you start seeing that we have just been told a pack of lies by the authorities and the mainstream media about this story. As I say in the bottom right hand corner of this screen, the fourth estate is dead. It really is. 
We need a new media in this country. And we certainly need people who are going to report on these uh, things as they come up in a fair and balanced way and not just be mouthpieces of the establishment, which is what people like Luke Harding are. He's arse gravy of the worst kind. Forget his narrative whenever you read anything from these people. Read behind the narrative and look at the facts. Ignore the spin, which is pretty much what that article was. If you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe and click the bell below. Independent voices like mine are being censored across all social media platforms by large tech companies at the behest of governments who don't like the fact that people like me are out there getting more popular telling the truth and ruining their propaganda. Unfortunately, they come after us monetarily as well, so we have to rely on our audience to fund our work. So if you can support independent media, do so. I've left a link to my Patreon down below and you can sign up to it for as little as a dollar a month and every dollar helps. I cannot stress that enough. Thanks very much for your support. Until next time, peace and take care.